Well, we have a lot to cover. We have the laicization of ex-Cardinal McCarrick, now Mr. McCarrick. Uh, we also have this new statement that's come out by Archbishop Vigano in anticipation of the Pope's summit in Rome on abuse. And today, Tim and I are going to make uh, projections on what's going to happen at that meeting. And of course, we'll cover it once it comes to completion. But we already have a pretty good idea of where it's going to go based on press releases and statements made by the Pope, by Supich and others. So good morning, Tim. Morning. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. So where should we begin this morning? I think maybe McCarrick. Let's get that done with. It's no choice. Yeah, let's let's go to uh, (laughs) McCarrick. The smell of justice. Yes. So a um, a little. Everybody's saying, look, this was because the the Rome Abuse Summit is coming up next week. It's clearly timed to be uh, dropped right before it so that when any of the the newspapers or news stations put a mic in front of their faces, they can say, well, we got rid of McCarrick. Yeah, it's 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 clearly obviously timed. It's a little it's a little peculiar that they waited this long because it they they waited long enough for people to be able to say that 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 it's clearly timed, right? Normally you do it a month ahead even if you wanted him to be able to maximize what's left of his career. It it's strange, but yes. Yeah, I mean, agreed. They did it. I mean, I'm just happy. Yeah. Everyone's like, well, they timed it. I think they timed it, but they did it. And this sure. sends a message to bishops and cardinals everywhere that, yeah, cardinal law covered up abuse, and he got, you know, care flighted out of America, and he was made archpriest of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome and had a really nice, you know, retirement in Rome, and he kind of had diplomatic immunity, was overseas, and what right. he had done in Boston was kind of behind him and no one could do anything about it. And then he died. Right. Now, I think Pope Francis has sent the right message that if you mess up, especially if you cause a big stink in my pontificate, you're done. Sure. I, whatever it is, seven months after the fact, sure. Then I mean, again, the timing's not paramount here, but the timing is... <clears throat> It's it's enough to to signify what the what the real purpose of the thing is. It's we got to get this done sometime before Thursday, whatever that is, the the beginning of the Vatican abuse summit. Sure. Yeah, but I agree. I agree. And then the other part of it is, well, JP two John Paul the second. He didn't lay aside McCarrick and he knew and Bennett the 16th didn't lay aside McCarrick and he knew, too. So Francis is the good guy. He's the true reformer. What do you think about that? True or false statement? Well, I mean, it's as a matter of fact, yes. As a matter of fact, President Obama is the presidency under which Osama bin Laden was caught, right? I mean, that that you can't you can't uh, you can't deny. But it, arguably, it was set up by Benedict JP two. That's a whole other story. I mean, you. You might want to say something about that, but I'll, I'll address Benedict. I mean, JP2 did nothing. Yeah, but it's it's at least partly speculative. We don't have the full story on it. Maybe you want to say something. But Benedict, yeah, I mean, he didn't lay aside him. He seems to have, of the three pontiffs, been the one that did the most, that did or would have done the most unforced uh, punitive action to McCarrick, right? I mean, I think that's that's sort of the way he would rehabilitate his papacy if he was looking to do so. JP2, it's a mess. Uh, yeah, I, know, I mean, it think? seems that JP2 was aware of some of it uh, in the second James Grind interview, the one that you were on, that we did on this channel. He said he told JP2 in, in the late 80s. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not good. I mean, it's... If you went by the old code of canon law, 1917, any crime against the Sixth Commandment, especially with a minor, would call for uh, expulsion from the clerical state and even loss of pension. It says that in the 1917 code. So, wow. yeah, this should have happened many decades ago, and it finally has happened. And I just hope this sets up a domino effect. I hope when more and more 
well, I don't hope this ever happens, but if it should be the case that there are bishops and cardinals who have done this, who have covered up for this, they also need to stand up to, um, to justice and take off the Zucchetto, take off the pectoral cross, and uh, go back to Mr. So-and-so. Yeah, regarding what you just said about what, what is our realistic hope with the size of the episcopate, the size of the priesthood in 2019 in the Catholic Church, in the visible church, you know, lot, lots of bad guys, lots of nut jobs running around with, with collars on. Yes, it, it, it will happen again. Um, particularly when you consider what I, what I think you and I would characterize as the main issue, which is with the homosexuality problem and following, following Archbishop Vigano, right? And common sense. It's a homosexuality problem within, uh, within ordained life. And, you know, one, one, almost 100% is, is it a homosexuality problem? Now that doesn't mean that 100% of the molesters were were homosexual uh, homosexuals, right? But but given these facts, then yes, it's one hundred percent reasonable to say when this horrible thing happens again. Sort of like it's reasonable to say when murder inevitably occurs again in New York City or Washington D.C. It's going to happen, and we don't. That doesn't mean we want it to, but it happens at this heightened rate because of the homosexuality question within the priesthood. Uh, I mean, yeah. we've addressed before why so many homosexuals in the priesthood. Um, we might revisit that today or sometime soon. But anyway, there it is. That's the problem. And so, no, it's not It's not silly at all of you to say if, if someone else is ever molested by a priest again, it's going to happen. And I say the Vatican Abuse Summit is not going to address anything um, efficaciously. No, no. Before we turn to that summit and uh, and Vegan O's new statement, because we love we love our Vegan O. Represent. Yeah. Cheers. Coffee. Yeah, cheers. Coffee. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Bailey's. Uh, cheers. Yeah. Yes, just coffee. <laughs> no. yeah. Um, I just want to here th- throw up on the screen here. This is McCarrick's pectoral cross that he can no longer wear anymore. He's no longer to be recognized as an archbishop, cardinal, or even a priest. Look at this thing, Tim. It's it's um, a it's not a cross. It's sort of a, a metallic gumby with a missing leg. It's yeah, a metallic one legged gumby. Yeah, I, I don't like like we were saying before we ran tape. I don't know why, whether you're conservative, liberal, gay, straight, <laughs> but, uh, you know. You like Pepsi or Coke? Why would you like this thing? It's it's a monster. You it's know? it's like so, someone made that in their like sophomore in high school like art project. <laughs> so, sophomore in grammar school maybe like second grade. It's yeah, like, wait, well, you have a soldering gun cool. and you and you bend some some wire from a coat hanger and you come up with this. This is offensive. Yes. You know, I don't understand why people weren't walking around the USCCB 15 years ago and they saw this this guy's pectoral cross like something's wrong with this guy. Yeah. I mean, is that honoring to our Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. That's, uh, what is this? It's very strange. I don't know how you uh, how did, I I'd never seen it before. How did you how had you seen this? Is this I had seen it in, in all the pictures with him, you know, sitting around with other cardinals and people. It's always there. I mean, there was one shot uh, about a month ago that went up on one of the news sites where he looks like he was in St. Peter's Square, but he was kind of leaning over and looking at someone and it was hanging. and It was very prominent. It was like squared up perfectly. And it, I was mm. like, yeah, there it is again. That looks horrible. Gumby. Yeah. yeah, and the missing leg. What's going on there? Because you can clearly see it's on the right leg. It's flattened out like a foot, but then the left leg above the knee is just amputated, gone. Yes, uh, I mean the scary thing is that would it neither. I mean, I I don't know. I'll speak for myself. I don't know. It doesn't sound like you know. There's something to it with this weird with the weird art. Mm. The, the left is always at, at some sort of skullduggery, right? So mm. there's, yeah, it's not just 
someone's crappy high school soldering project. It's <laughs> there's something to it. I mean, whenever there's a, a funky looking pontifical meeting hall, have you seen that thing? Yeah, the Paul Six Hall. Yeah, yeah, the Paul Six Hall. It's have just, you seen that? Yeah, been in it. The, the serpent. Hitty. Yeah, the head. Have you seen the serpent head? The head. Was, I mean, it looked like a serpent head from the outside. On the inside, they had that gross looking. It's supposed to be a resurrection of Christ, but, but I've seen that. I had seen that before, but I only recently saw the Paul the Sixth Hall from the outside. It is the exact. It is exactly modeled of a snake's head from the side and from the front, and then they say even yeah. Jesus's hair in that apocalyptic central thing is supposed to look like serpents. So, um, it's not good. It's, I mean, it's very not good, and that's more out in the open. I don't know what they're thinking with it, but yeah, there's always something behind the art, and so there's yeah, I like I like how you put research. that. Yeah, I, yeah. There's where well, there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, just even things like the cathedral in Los Angeles, back in your neck of the woods. What is up with that? It's a botched Lego project. It's horrible. It is abysmal. I, I don't know. I, it's it's when they start with the. I mean, there's abysmal architecture, right? Which we talk about a lot here on TNT. But, and, and I'm not. I'm the last guy to defend abysmal architecture. There's, there's, all, there's something to that too. I've talked about the works of uh, this Hegelian Hollier called Against Architecture before, where it's like, you know, t- t- to take down the the patriarchy, the goal, you know, you take down the the structure. The structure is has figuratively been taken to be the bones of the patriarchy, and the the beautiful basilicas of the capital cities of Europe is something they do much better than America. There's not a ton we think about as being beaten on by Europe, but they said we need to undo this in America. Mm. So that that's why we have such ugly buildings here. But when there's actually obvious imagery, like one leggedness, there's some research that with a, um, don't research that with a full stomach. Right. Yeah. There's you, if you turn up any actual if you have fruit for research, you're going to find something that's that's either bad or very insinuative of something bad. Yeah. I mean, my discernment of spirits is this is uh, Freemasonic or satanic. There's something occult with this. It, it's McCarrick laughing as he's going around in his car, red cardinal robes and he's got this mockery of the crucifixion on his chest. Um, well, and, I don't and like hiding it. in plain sight. Yeah, no, yeah exactly. Sorry, plain I sight. Wasn't trying to, yeah, that's, that is the way, right? I mean, did you want to say something about that? Cause well, I, hiding in plain sight is people ask, why do this? Look at the Paul's sixth hall. We yeah. should, we should show that it's yeah, hiding in yeah. plain sight. Put it on the screen. Um, I once had, was graced to have dinner with Cardinal Burke and just a man of, of great manners and sanctity and all that. And I remember we were having dinner and he, he, he has a very nice pectoral cross. Very nice. And he, he put it in his, um, what do you call it? Fascia. And stuck it there. So it wouldn't fall into the food, right? It was sticking out. But then towards the end of the meal, a seminarian came and wanted a photo op with him. So, you know, this is like a millennial seminarian. It's like, He's kind of finishing up his food, you know, not not a good moment. But anyway, the yeah. cardinal was very gracious and obliged him. And while they were kind of setting up their photo, I, I watched Cardinal Burke very delicately took his cross out with devotion even and laid it and centered it and then looked up for the picture. And I thought, mm-hmm. you know, here he, he, he wants to he wants the cross to be prominent. Mm-hmm. in this photo he like took the time to bring it out to center the cross you know he didn't like worry about getting like carrot out of his tooth or whatever or spinach mm-hmm. he like set mm-hmm. it up and and i just made an impression on, on me you know like you hear these stories of young people they watch like a professor or a religious sister like with the care and devotion they make the sign of the cross and those kind of things convert people you know sometimes you hear these stories that was kind of one of those things where I watched Cardinal Burke and I thought, wow, he loves the cross. Right. You know, and so to, to, to experience that with Cardinal Burke and then to see this with the Gumby thing, it's just, I, I'm telling you, I think there's something satanic here. I'd love to know who made this, where it came from. Yeah, we could, I mean, someone out there 
could be very useful actually look take yeah take a half hour and and look it up i mean i might do it afterwards but mm -hmm. it does your, your cardinal burke story does show beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is at least with part of the cardinal it is it's a um in part of the episcopacy um it's supposed to be a central icon you know like it is, well it is the central like it is the icon yeah. capital i but it, but it, it shows that it's an important part of their iconography even more than a priest. If you have a pectoral cross, that you're thinking about it first with a photo op, that that does tell a lot. And yep. um, yeah, well, we should we should try to figure out what that is. Yeah. I'm sure it's not good. It's not I, good. I bet dollars to donuts it ain't it ain't. Yeah. I think it's it's queer or it's satanic Freemason something. And even, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, get too much into pectoral crosses, but even Pope Francis' pectoral cross is a little uh -huh. unusual. It doesn't have, like, Christ on it. It's a cross, but then Christ is holding, like, a lamb. You know what right. I mean? I have seen that one. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I mean, That's I, weird. You know, at least it's Christ holding a lamb, not, like, missing a leg. Yeah, but logistically, it, it suggests that he can't, this couldn't be Jesus on, like, the actual right. cross of, like, well, Calvary. what's the Latin word for a shepherd? Pastor, pastoral. It's a pastoral. <laughs> it's a it's, yeah. a it's a pectoral cross in the pastoral <laughs> mode. Right, right, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it's it's weird. It's, I didn't realize until semi recently that they could personalize these things. I thought it was like standard issue, you know. No, yeah, you can pick your own. There's a little shop. <laughs> I've seen a little shop. Uh, just off the uh, the uh, Piazza of St. Peter that does pectoral crosses for a lot of the bishops. And most of the ones in that shop look really cool. You know, they're like what you'd think of as medieval. Gold, some stones in it. You know, right. crosses. They look like crosses. Right. Uh, like the one you always wear, but you're not wearing it today. Well, I have it underneath. Okay. It's hard with the, uh, it's right. hard with the zipper thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I always have that bad boy on. Yep. Yeah, why would you not want? Well, you see that. I mean, since we're talking about that, that the the it's not it's very respectful, but because it's so big, um, I even don't like the, the one thing I don't like about it is the lack of detail on the body and the face of Jesus. Like, if it's going to be that big, you kind of got to do that much detail. That would have made it much more expensive. But yeah, I'm pe I'm picky with crucifixes, you know, with the because it's the body of our Lord. It's the most most uh, vulnerable body of our Lord because it's on the cross. So you That's want right. a good. I mean, remember um, the shepherd staff? Um, I used to have that exact replica. Of oh, the one that this, the one that John Paul used to always carry. Yeah, and Benedict Benedict didn't Benedict get it from him? I, John yeah, well, Paul had it. You're talking I, about the one just, that's kind of like. It's kind of got like a bent bar. Yes. And the and hands are up is, like this. Yeah. Yes. And the knees are out. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of that. I like how it shows the extreme. Yeah. It's extreme. Of, of Jesus's body. I, I always, I yeah, always he's like, like that. super slumped down. Have you ever heard of a Jansenist crucifix? I have. Yeah. So the Jansen, yeah. so the Jansenist believe that Jesus only died for the saved, not for everyone else. Right. Now, I mean, Thomas Aquinas says he sufficiently died for all humans, but it's only efficient for the elect, right? Of for course. The, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's, but the Jansenists said, no, he sufficiently only d died for the elect. So their crucifixes, and maybe I can find one and put it on the screen, but the Jansenist crucifix doesn't have the arms out. The Jansenist crucifix has the arms up to show that right. only a few are saved, not all are saved. And that crucifix was actually banned by the Holy See. You can't make them. You can't make one with the arms where he's hanging. Sometimes you'll see actual art. Sometimes it's Protestant too, where he's, his hands are like this on the cross and he's falling. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some people say that that, that crucifix, actually it was Paul VI who had it made. Um, that, and it might have been made by the same guy who made the ugly thing in the Paul VI center, the resurrection scene. With the snake Did hair. It? I think it was he's the same Italian. artist. It's an Italian that made it. I'll bet you he's P2 or something. Yeah. yeah. I think he's the one that made it. And some people have criticized that crucifix. Um, 
because like the popes don't carry a crozier, they carry like a staff with a cross, and it's got that crucifix on top. That right. Christ arms are a little bit too much this way and not enough. Yeah, Embracing the whole angle. world. Yeah. You need an ob. Yeah, ob I know. I don't know. Like, did the Holy oh, yeah. See say yeah. like, okay, one eighty is good. One twenty or less. One twenty, yeah. but once yeah. you get to, yeah, what would this be? I don't know. Sixty. So it'd be like, yeah, you're making you making like an eighty degree angle with your arms. It, it becomes Jansenist. Yeah, it at that point, your- it's Jansenist. I don't know. So I'm not a big fan of that one either. I just like the traditional. Like if you look at some of the old paintings of the popes from from olden times, he has sort of like a. I don't know. It looks more like a just a cross. It's not a crucifix. I don't know what it's called. I need to look into this and, and get my terminology right. But anyway, enough about that. McCarrick, he's out. He's just Mr. McCarrick now, and he's living at a monastery next to a school. Bad idea, but I'm not in charge. Yeah, he's just a dude <laughs> hanging out by the pool drinking some Schmitzke. Right? Yeah, that's right. Mean, that's right. <laughs> I mean, what? yeah, now he's just he's Mr. McCarrick, right? He's he's is he running a daycare business over oh, at his place or what? Hope what, not. It, failing daycare, but I mean, yeah, what's he gonna do with his time now? Uh, I mean, you, hopefully, yeah, repent. Not, hopefully, yeah. what's he really gonna do with his time? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, no, I. It's he's done. It's a done deal, and of course, it was done days before. Are uh, the opening of the Vatican abuse summit? So I, I really think, I really think they're 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 kind of hiding that one in plain sight too. To me, it's yeah, it's it's great, it's done. But I I didn't I sort of didn't say this before. It's almost like a, a bit of a middle finger because they're like we're gonna do this, you know, twelve hours before the Vatican abuse summit. So then we can sort of keep him a priest as long as we can keep him keep him in the in all the garb and with all the accruing honors uh appertaining honors as long as humanly possible and then we'll you know we'll do this formality but he's still you know you guys you guys all know he's still gonna he's still okay in our our view that's that's how i feel it is hey, Daddy. yep oh i, I have a visitor school. you stay home from school he's not feeling well no because um uh Place got me sick. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm recording a video. I'll be down. Hey, Daddy, at lunch we go like to Donald's. Okay. Or Waterburger. Okay, we'll go to Waterburger at lunch. Oh, All right, so Waterburger. <laughs> She's like, I've, <laughs> breakfast of champions. Yeah, for, exactly. For little, <laughs> for little sick girls. Who, who was that? That was Lily. That was Lily. Um, who got her sick? Blaze. Blaze got her sick. Yeah, it's funny. She exactly knew the yeah. through the incubation period <laughs> of right. how long. She's like, you got a household of sick kids, and it's like, you're the one. Yeah, you, you got it me It was sick. you, Fredo. Fredo got me sick. <laughs> um, okay, so what we're talking about here, McCare. Oh, and then what was interesting, Tim, is they, they released it late on Friday, which is classic U.S. politician move. It that is. You, you don't want people to comment on it all week. You want the story to kind of be dead by Monday. Which it kind of well, was for us. People were, people were saying, hey, why aren't you doing the McCarrick story? It's like, well, it's Friday and it's Saturday. And we got things going on. Church is Sunday. We don't really record on Sunday. I mean, they right. maybe they did it because they knew TNT was going to jump on it. I mean, we're That's busy men with is. our families. Got them scared. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, the funny thing is it's it's classic HR policy, right? You don't fire someone's like office space filmed in, in Dallas there. We saw some office space memes from the TNT yeah. fandom <laughs> recently, which, which it's a funny movie. I just rewatched it uh, coincidentally. But yeah, you fire someone at 4.30 on, on Friday to avoid office shootings, right? So right. They, they pretty much, Vatican is following standard US HR policy. Yeah. They're like McCarrick, this might come as a shock, buddy, but you know you're not going to be a you're not going to be a, a priest anymore, functionally speaking. Yeah, pink he slip. Was shocked. Four thirty. Yeah, pink slip. Yeah, he, he like the the pink slip. They 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 color coded it just for him. And they're like, hey, but, um, <laughs> that weird pectoral cross, you can't wear that anymore. Wear that on the inside of your shirt, bro. <laughs> exactly. The one-legged Jesus, that's, that's, that's something weird. weird. Now, yeah. the other we, thing before, and this just came to mind, is they appointed uh, 
his old roommate, his know nothing roommate, Cardinal Farrell as Camerlengo. Did I say that right? Yeah. The Chamberlain. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And and the Camerlengo or the Chamberlain of the Holy See is in charge once the Pope dies or resigns to organize the conclave. So we now have, oddly enough, in a conjunction of events, the ex roommate who never saw anything, Tim, is now in charge of the next papal conclave. Not only that, Farrell was, he used to be the driver for a guy named Marcio Maciel, the great demonic founder of the Legionaries of Christ. He went on from there to DC where he became an auxiliary archbishop and roommate with Cardinal McCarrick. And now he's at this high office in right. Rome, and it seems that his specialty is never to see anything bad going on with people he works with. Yeah, blind, blind, and <laughs> blind, his, deaf, and dumb. It's on right. his resume. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm a blind. He was a driver, and he's blind, deaf, and dumb. I didn't know he was a driver for uh, Maciel. Saw some, some, some bad stuff. Um, I did not know that, but yeah, I, I did know he was Chamberlain and. It's more of the same, right? It's business as usual. I mean, this is what I mean. How how skeptical can you guys be? We we have some people ask, and it's like, I mean, look, look at the look at the rogues gallery of guys running this stuff. Um, it's 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 all the usual suspects when it comes down to the abuse summit, the guys in power. I mean, it's the usual crew. It's the skeleton yeah. crew. Yeah, and uh, it, he's got he soup. The ghost of McCarrick lives on through Farrell in Rome. Through Supich, who's running the show this week, running the show in America for sure. Uh, Cardinal Tobin, and who knows who else in in the European or Asian church. Uh, McCarrick's ghost lives on, so he might be removed from the clerical state, but his influence and his impact is still being felt, and probably will well, be in, for decades. In the Asian church, which we by and large characterizes more healthy um it's it's cardinal tagle right yeah he, he's, he's been a big player in the filipino church i mean we in america tend to in sweeping language speak admirably of the philippines sort of cultural scene even though it's got it's got a couple weird weird flies in the ointment um but the yeah cardinal tagle is always the guy in in the last few years that you hear pushing back he's he's the francis side and he is he's on the crew and he is one of the the first he's actually the first guy i think um mentioned i've seen on two different lists as a featured talk for the vatican abuse summit he's so you mentioned the asian church that's how they're getting you're infecting the host yeah and he's definitely team francis he's also seen as one of the the number one uh candidates for the next pope Yes. And he would certainly yeah. be a Francis the second type of yes. Pope. Yeah. He's, he's deeply embedded with the agenda of Pope Francis. So I would not be excited about that. No, no, it's, it's not good. All right. So Tim, should we look at this, um, this essay by Archbishop Cardinal Vigano? This yeah, was, sure. this was put out on national Catholic register um, it seemed that there was some kind of a symposium, and it looks like it was an online symposium. Uh, I don't think they actually met. Um, no. But um, Archbishop Vigano submitted this, I guess we're calling it an essay. It's, this is not like his testimonies from before. It actually it feels a lot different. Um, it's a little bit biographical. Uh, it's more casual. So it's, it's not like Vigano 1, 2, or 3 or even his, his address to the, um, the USCCB. Um, what did you think of it, Tim? Yeah, I mean, that was actually the primary, the, the meta-historical narrative that, that went with all the first Vigano letters is missing here. That was the, the primary thing that stuck out to me at first was just, wow, you kind of forget he's on the lamb and he's, he's living just a life on the lamb, you know, it's something it's, it's storied stuff. Um, you get none of that with this because NCR published it and they make no mention of the historical situation of Vigano. It makes one wonder if he's somehow, uh, 
if a situation is changing or they know it's going to be changing. So that's that's the first thing I thought. Yeah, right? I yeah. Mean, it, it, makes it jumps out at you. Yeah, he's definitely, this is addressed to the upcoming Rome Summit on abuse. And at the very beginning, this guy, I think, sets up that he's, this is more of a fireside chat with Vigano. And he says, my contribution will draw on my personal experience of 51 years of priesthood. Right. So he's, he's, t he's pulling out the pipe by the fireplace and he's going to tell us kind of the grandpa take on the priesthood. And he says, I entered a pontifical seminary in Rome and began my studies at the Gregorian University. That's where you studied. Yes. When I was 25 years old. It was 1965, just months before the end of Vatican II. I couldn't help but notice, not only in my own college, but also in many others in Rome, that some seminarians were very immature and that these houses of formation were marked by a general and very serious lack of discipline. He goes on to say, a few examples will suffice. Seminarians sometimes spent the night outside my seminary as the supervision was woefully inadequate. Our spiritual director was in favor of priestly ordination ad tempus. That is the idea that ordained priesthood could be merely a temporary status. I'll pause here. So this he's saying when he was ordained, it was right at the end of Vatican II. And he sees just a laxity amongst formation. And this is the laxity, folks, that created the abuse scandal. Sure. If you have guys who are going and spend the night outside the seminary and doing stuff in the city of Rome that you don't know about, the, the military wouldn't wouldn't allow this while you're on duty or while you're in formation. Uh, and when they do allow it, sometimes usually the soldiers don't they usually get into a bunch of trouble. <laughs> That's why they don't allow it. Um, yeah, a bunch of half American babies nine months later. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but but one thing it's it's. Uh, weaponized laxity right now. Mm -hmm. Now we stick that adjective on everything, but that's the whole point of, of these guys of the rules changing in the seminaries. Then what he's complaining about is not just the, it's not just, it's looking the other way with a purpose, right? It's not just that they had a, a you know, a drunken skipper who likes to play slalom with the icebergs as it were, you know I mean? They, they have guys skippers that are probably being told, stand down, let these guys go. We have a bunch of young homosexuals in the priesthood. Now look the other way. So it's weaponized. Yeah. Yeah. This is also a little scary where he says our spiritual director. So this is their spiritual director was in favor of priestly, ordination ad tempus. So this is the idea. Now, the Catholic Church believes, going back to, well, the New Testament, but St. Augustine especially, when you're ordained a priest, you receive an indelible character on your soul. So Theodore McCarrick is removed from the clerical state, but he still has the character of bishop, priest, and deacon on his soul and will forever, whether he's in heaven, hell, purgatory, his soul has that mark. So right. it's forever. So if, you know, a man gets hit by a bus and McCarrick's walking by, McCarrick can absolve that man, even if he's removed from the clerical state. This theology is more Lutheran. Luther said that there was no indelible character and that you could have men coming and going from the ministry. Right. He, di he denied the priesthood. Right. That's scary because you, as a ordained man, you can justify a lot of sin and bad stuff by just saying, well, I'm a priest now and turning your priesthood on and off. Yeah. It sounds like Islam. You can have, you can have temporary marriages, right. Yeah. For, for, uh, a tempus, uh, you know, a guy can marry a, a woman for a prostitute. Yeah. A prostitute as long as it takes no, no adultery there. Yep. And then divorce her 20 minutes later. Right. It, it's, it's, you know, at least in the West, we always associate it with, with sexual sin, you know, the right. rationalization of, and the enabling of sexual sins. And I think I'm, I'm certain that's what the wink and the nod is. Yeah. Oh, you think that's what Viganos winking and nodding here about? <laughs> Certainly. Well, I don't you, I, I thought that's why you were bringing it. Well, why else would he say that? I mean, you th you're thinking it's just a Lutheran thing. I don't think with Martin Luther, this is what he intended it to be. Vatican II, 1965. Yeah. I bet I bet the farm. That's right. That, I mean, because he's he's the one that's connecting it with the moral laxity. I mean, when 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 morals go licentious and people start staying out all night, 
we're not talking about, you know, then people aren't actually painting the town red, right? Yeah. It, it's not vandalism no, yeah, yeah, that you're we're right. worried about. It's Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. This because if you look at the context of everything that Vigano is saying and is about to say about the the fall of the priesthood in the sixties and seventies, he's pointing out that this is the theology of the priesthood that let it happen. Ordinate t- temporary ordination. So yeah, right. guys are just turning they're turning on and off their priesthood like a light switch when they want it when they want it to be, and that's that's pretty messed up. He goes on to say at the Gregorian, one of my professors of moral theology favored situation ethics, boo, hiss, and some classmates confided to me that their spiritual directors had no objection to their presenting themselves for priestly ordination despite their unresolved and continual grave sins against chastity. Can I share a story? Yes. At the Greg, I had, you know, I was taking the test in Italian. I, a lot of my tests I didn't have to take in Italian. Some professors wouldn't let you choose. In my ethics class, guess what I had? Uh, um, I had et- et- Etique de la Situazione. And mm-hmm. I didn't even, I looked at it like once just in, before I came to Italian grad school. And I was like, but we'd, we'd been studying Aristotle. So I was like, well, Aristotle's, the whole, the whole thing about virtue ethics is that they're kind of, you, they're particularizable, uh, unlike Kant's ethics, unlike, on the other hand, uh, Mill's ethics, uh, uh, which are pure particularization. Kant's are all general, right? That's what Kantian ethics are. You deal in only these big, big broad categoricals. So I was like, okay, this, I, this is a weird way to ask the question about ethics of the situation. And I was like, it sounds like situation ethics, but this couldn't be what they're talking about. <laughs> and I literally just wrote a good Aristotelian answer. And I ended up getting like the equivalent of an A minus in the class. But the professor was like, yeah, I wanted you to talk about situation ethics. I'm like, the garbage from the, I was like, oh, by the Jesuits, I am at the yeah. Greg. But I was like, this is, I, I really dodged a bullet. He could have, he could have been more mean. I guess the situation ethics told the professor in that situation give me a good grade you know, right. because, I, because of the extenuating. So I guess, I guess he was, he was practicing what he preached, but yeah. I really was freaked out once I learned that he wanted the, the situation ethics, relativism in the church BS. That's, yeah. that's what situation ethics are. But yeah. I thought it was funny. He mentioned that he was at the Greg I was too. Yeah. Well, parents, yeah. if you're, if you're a high school student, but usually it's college students, I've noticed they get into philosophy one-on-one or they take uh, college ethics and they get blasted with situation ethics. And this is where the professor creates all of these odd situations that obliterates their traditional morality. It's their, 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 uh, their life, lifeboat ethics are kind of common lifeboat in all ethics. ethics classes. But exception makes bad law, yep. as we actually say in the law. And there are all these exceptions that are geared to destroy the rule, the yep. big bright yep. line rule. Yeah, it's the kind of stuff where, you know, there's two train tracks and one of them is full of refrigerators that has 5,000 frozen embryos on it. And the other one has uh, four um, 10 year old kids on it. And you can only pull the lever and and save one train before it goes off the cliff. Which one do you pull? Right. And so the whole the whole setup is to get you to devalue life. That situation is never going to actually happen. But what it does is it erodes the young person, the 18 year old person's understanding of objective right and wrong. And that's That's right. That's what situation ethics does. So it must be rejected. I I thought these situations never actually happened. I had a third cousin to whom this actually happened. He was on two train tracks. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Like Harry Harry says, when Harry met, I actually, yeah. No, they'll never happen. Yeah. They will never never happen. happen. They're, like you said, the end game is just beginning to uh, use Aristotelian habit to habituate that that neural pathway. We're like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm a Catholic. I like I like embryos more than a non Catholic. But yeah, there really is a difference. 10,000 of them. It's not quite the same thing as 10,000 kids. Right. And that, that's yeah. all they have to do. Yeah. Is plant the germ in the host. Right. That's, that's And then by the end of the semester, you're like, well, yeah, I mean, partial birth abortion in certain situations makes sense. I mean, that's that's the game. That's Situation. the game. Situation yeah. ethics. So uh, don't let your kids take those courses because they'll lose their morality. Promise you yeah. that. 
Okay, yeah. so um, then he goes on. To, so he was saying that these guys are getting their their spiritual director saying, "Yes, you're committing sins against chastity, but it's okay. Go ahead and get ordained." This is 1965, folks. This is Vatican II. Then it goes on. Certainly those who suffer from deep-seated same-sex attraction should never be admitted to seminary. This is Vigano. Moreover, before any seminarian is accepted for ordination, he must not only strive for chastity, but actually achieve it. He must already be living chaste celibacy peacefully and for a prolonged period of time. For right. if this is lacking... The seminarian and his formators cannot have the requisite confidence that he's called to the celibate life. Archbishop Vigano, this is great. I mean, I have heard a rector of the seminary say that all these seminarians are masturbating. That's a big deal. That's a problem. That's a big problem. If they're, yeah. if they're, have, if they're homosexuals and they're acting out in a homosexual way, even if they're heterosexuals and they're hooking up with girls on the weekend— or over Christmas break. You can't be a priest, dude. You don't have the virtue. You don't have the habituation to live a celibate life. You're going to go get a girl pregnant. You're going to get into gay liaisons. It's a disaster. Thomas Aquinas says, for a man to be ordained deacon, he must remove all mortal sin from his life. For a man to be a priest, he must remove all purposeful venial sins. From his life, he must be on the illuminative way. Right. And then we, what, what does Fran, what, I mean, what does uh, Thomas say about bishops? They basically are must be saints. Hardly any sin at all in their life. Only slight venial sins. And all this makes sense. This is kind of the the little little kids' conception of what a priest is, anyway. Someone that's super holy. Sin. More, super holy, taking sin even more seriously than the holiest guy in the laity in in his flock, and it's it's not it's not that far fetched. Um, but nowadays, what you hear from in in homiletics week by week, I, I heard this two weeks in a row. I was like, guys, we're just like you. It's two priests in a row saying, you know, look, we're sinners, we're not saints. We're preaching this stuff, we're trying to practice it, but we're not saying that we're able to actually practice it. It's garbage. That's no good. Right? It's garbage. It's just, it's again, it's hiding in plain sight, which is everything they do. It's hiding the new low lowered weaponized expectations um, out there in plain sight. So you're saying, Hey, look, we're not hypocrites. We're, we're, we told you in our homily, we're not, we're not even setting the bar high enough to try. Uh, so yeah, it's yeah. It's yeah if you bad. read, if you read like Dionysius, the Areopagite, like ecclesiastical hierarchy, the way he understands the church is you have Christ who sanctifies the angels and the bishop and the bishop sanctifies the priest and the priest sanctifies the deacon. And through these three sacred ministers, they sanctify the laity. We actually has the religious, the monks and then the laity. And they do this sacramentally, but they're also doing it through their own life. Like their moral sanctity is elevating. It's very Platonic, right? It's all about participation. That's how right. Dionysius the Areopagite lines it all up. And Thomas Aquinas sure. is quoting Dionysius nonstop. So they're pulling the lower levels of nature up into the economy of grace. And it's not just sacramental function by hearing confessions and saying mass it's their actual moral interior life is elevating the lower levels in the church the laity so we need to get back right. to that right i mean that's right. that's cooler that's john vienni here's a holy priest and he transformed an entire town and he said once he said to another priest do you want to see my relic collection and he goes yeah and he took him outside of the graveyard he goes this is my relic collection he was talking about his parishioners who had died and were buried in the graveyard he was ca he was counting them, rendering them as saints. Yeah, yeah, proud proud of of uh, fallen comrades that had done a, a good job that were now, to borrow the Platonic term, participating in in a higher in in existence itself. Yeah, the, the doctrine of, of participation from from Plato is uh, key here because when he says participation, he's meaning it in this in this nuanced way where. When you're 
I mean, all all human life participates in real existence, but in a in a lower level, right? In our sinful state, you know, it wouldn't be how Plato would say it. And in our material state, he would say, but the Christian Platonists start saying, yeah, sin sin is a lack of being. You know, when you free yourself from this life, which is what what I'm doing again, going through Exodus 90, it's it's the Christian Exodus. You're you're moving up into a higher ontological state of participation in real being, in true being. Whereas material existence, which, which sin tends to bring you deeper into material existence, um, you are you're barely participating in being. And 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 yeah, priests, when we when we talk about uh, a willingness to engage in the world, and when this means a willingness to look the other way and even to tacitly encourage sin, it's 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 pushing pushing priests and secondarily tertiarily their flocks, their eventual flocks, lower into sin and saying you don't need to get to the state of real existence where you're participating most directly in the existence of the one true thing that exists, God. Yeah. You know, it, it just struck me. I never thought of it before, but the, the Dionysian idea of participation is wrapped up in the liturgy. Of course, he says that, but it's really wrapped up in this idea of ad orientum. If you think about it, if the priest is facing the same way as you, it's emphasizing the idea of the participation in sanctity that he's leading. Right. He's 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 elevating and leading you. This makes complete sense now when you think about it, even from like a metaphysical point of view. He is yeah. leading the people deeper into Christ. Right. And when he turns around, that whole metaphysical hierarchy of participation of the lower into the higher is broken. And I think this sure. gets priests off the hook. They're like, well, I'm just a functionary. You know, I'm, I'm like the guy who serves the burgers. Right. Right. And we're like, no, we want you to be the guy who makes the burgers. That's right. You know, like you need to be in, you need to be in the process of actually how this stuff is made. And the the traditional old style understanding, the patristic understanding, the Dionysi and the Thomistic, all of this is that the priest must be a saint. We're calling you father. And this we've gotten a big debate on this on, on Twitter several weeks ago, but we call the priest father as an honorific because he is nurturing our soul. Right. We are growing in grace because of what he is doing. His liturgia, right? His work for the people. That's why we call him father. Not because he sits in a rectory, not because he wears a collar, not just even because he says mass, but because he has an ontological priesthood for a purpose, and that is to make us saints. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, uh, the ad orientum thing is important because when the priest faces, you know, the wall, you know, liturgical East, when he faces our Lord, the, the, you know, he is directing everyone's gaze, the faithful, uh, to gaze at the wall and basically to be, uh, otherwise you're just looking at a wall, right? He's leading them higher into uh, a state of, of being right. Whereas, when he turns around and faces them, then he's he's basically owning his materiality, his corporeality, and he's saying, "Look, we're just looking at each other." It's a it's a very direct state. It is. This is all. Yeah. This is this is what we. Anytime ad orientum comes up, this is what we're talking about. It's it's yeah. a very. I wouldn't even call it symbolism. It's just it's direct phenomenology that follows yes. from from the change between ad you know versus populum ad orientum. It, it's not that's even true. it's not even like that's really obvious imagery what they're doing. They're they're just owning it. Yeah, and it, it also the idea that only the priest can touch the host is another Platonic participation. It's another Dionysian mystery that only he can touch the host. He participates yeah. in the life of Christ in persona Christi. We lay people, we do by baptism in an interior way, but externally in the ministry, we do not participate in that. Only he does. And when you right. blur those lines and grandma and uncle Dan are handing out communion <laughs> in, yeah. a, in a Grover shirt and a Christmas sweater, you obliterate that. And again, you let the priest off the hook. He gets to just right. be another one of the people up there. He's kind of equalized 
you know, there's the priest line, everybody kind of like the, the Gordons are sneaking over into his line. But in reality, his line is you're saying symbolically his line's no better than grandma's line or Uncle Dan's line. They're all Precisely. sort of, he, yeah, he's got some vestments on, but he's really right there with everybody else. His priesthood isn't that great. It's not that elevated. Bad theology. Right. Right. It's sort of like, it's sort uh, again, it's the Michael Scott papacy where it's, it's, look, you're the boss. You have a higher salary than us. You don't get to like come back out and sit in your old desk when you were just a salesman and with the, uh, with the kind of lowered expectations, you might screw off some. The boss has the highest expectations um, he's the most removed from the the wants of the flesh, right? Like, yeah, even when I'm tired, I know everyone's looking at me. The office runs based around me. So even when I'm tired, I push through it. I understand the psychology that sometimes a boss wants to quit and sometimes just wants to go back to his old salesman's desk, but he can't, he can't. And that's, that's what being, that's, that's what platonic leadership is, right? It's, it's, the man who doesn't want the power but but loves the good must be the one with the power. Um, these guys don't get to just say, "Hey, we're human. We're flesh and blood." Like we and they're trying. They're openly right. embracing the. You know, we're gonna we're gonna come and uh, participate willfully, joyfully, at, within a lower, more sinful state of existence with you guys. And instead of leading you up, you're kind of bringing us down. Yeah. Everything after Vatican II is this. They don't wear the cassock. Yeah. yeah. They don't wear the collar. You know, they downgraded the vestments. They turned around and faced the people. The lay people started touching the, hanging out the Eucharist, touching the Eucharist with their own hands. All of this was a degradation of the priesthood. And right. again, it lets the priest off the hook. They're not right. Even the even the divine office, the liturgy, the hours went from take taking a couple hours to say every day to under an hour. You yeah. know, it was very monastic, very difficult. The liturgy, the hours now is it's kind of just like a little quiet time, like what right. a like what a evangelical does at a coffee shop with this right. cup of Joe. Right. Right. So we got to, I mean, this is one reason why I love the traditional Latin mass. I love the Eastern rites because all of this, this hierarchy, this participation is still present and it worked for not only hundreds of years, but almost 2000 years. Why did we go and change it? 1965 to 1970. Look, look who we're at folks. Yeah. Recipes, the liquid, or the thing speaks itself, and it eventuates. It's like an input-output machine. All that stuff. Uh, half the time, I feel like these shows are input, same input. This this bad theology we're talking about, middle '60s, and what what cross what went into the middle '60s is stuff from 50, 60, 70 years before. And that day, we're talking about here's one particular bad work product of the council, right? Mm -hmm. um, here's another particular one that a lot of times that's a different show, another particular one. Now we're talking about really what it's done to the priesthood. That's why we're hitting this so hard today is because the, the, the clerical scandal, the sh summer of shame, um, everything that this, that this Vatican abuse summit is going to avoid addressing is a problem with the priesthood. That's what. That's why you're hitting this so hard. Um, bad theology, and people say, "Well, that's just that's that's pie in the sky. That's that's intellectual ideas." No, ideas drive the world. The uh, it was also part of their ideas to get a certain uh, um, sacerdotal class, right? So not only are the standards more than a little lower, they are they are almost um, diametrically opposed to what the standards used to have been. They got, they went out and we know from the Marxists, the Masons, they were seeking a different kind of young men instead of virtuous young men, vicious young men, the young men who had some of the most unforgivable uh, sins that crowd to heaven and were being hand selected. And when you combine the low standards, this is what I meant about that first part of the Vigano, uh, first line of the second paragraph of the Vigano letter. You have a, a different kind of young man and you're saying, go do what you do, right? Agi quad agis. Yeah. Like, do your thing. You be you. You do you. Whatever it is. Yeah. Um, 
And what, what are they going to do? You just got a bunch of vicious young men that are inclined toward homosexuality, and you say you got a, 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 a temporary priesthood, an on-off switch on your priesthood. This was all designed. It was all weaponized. And so, so on the output end of this thing, of the spectrum, you wind up, you know, 50, 60, 50 years later, um, a bunch of uh, young, a precisely what one ought to expect to see when you put a bunch of homosexuals in the priesthood and you say, do what you want to do. You be you. It's, you be you. Like, it's a bunch of, you know, there, there's there's some outliers here. There's some molested girl altar boys. There are some molested, like, prepubescent altar boys. Uh, those are outliers, though. All right, 80 to 85 percent by all the different measures. It's always 80 to 85 percent, which is a strong enough my, uh, majority to be scientific and to tell us really what what you do you translates to. You do you translates to, unfortunately, uh, they go and molest a bunch of post pubescent young men. You know, young young men who are like middle teens, and the message. Regarding all this, it, at uh, the, the message of Vigano has always been: this is a problem with clerical homosexuality, and it's it's also what your common sense is telling you. The message I predict starting Thursday at the abuse summit will be: at all costs. Sometimes just squint at it. Sometimes talk around it. Sometimes, if you have to directly countenance it, fine. But it will always be this: implicitly, explicitly. This has nothing to do with homosexuality and everyone just don't cover up your lying eyes. Listen to us. We'll tell you, don't listen to your lying eyes and ears, which are going to tell you it's homosexuality. It's not. Yep. Did you see the, uh, Ed Penton asked the question to Cardinal Supich on this topic and it's, it's really awkward. It's actually creepy because Supich, he's just, he's super nervous. He's like playing with this little pencil and he, he's saying, no, um, this is really about the kids. The kids are the most vulnerable. The kids don't have a voice. So this is going to focus on the children because, you know, they're the ones that are vulnerable, not the not the adults. So that was, you know, right off the bat. I said, this is what we got to talk about on TNT, because Supich is telling us before it even begins. No, we are not going to address homosexuality. We are not going to address seminarians clericalizing with priests. We're not going to talk about priests clericalizing with priests. Uh, and we're not going to talk about priests clericalizing with teenage boys. This is going to, we're going to put all the focus on the children because they have no voice. And I'm all about that. My heart breaks that young children have experienced uh, these horrible crimes. But the elephant in the room, as you say, is the homosexual clericalizing of adults with adults and adults with young men. Dad, uh, that mom's making you some eggs. Okay, thank you, babe. Mom's <laughs> everyone, good. mom is making me some eggs. Nummy, nummy. That sounds good right now. It, 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 here's the thing. This is how nested hierarchies work. When you say as a nested hierarchy, I do not want you breaking any vows of chastity. It's beautiful, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, when, when you're when this is how authority is supposed to work, you can lay down that kind of genus as as uh, you can proscribe it all at once. So you can say, no, you're all you all took a vow of chastity. It doesn't matter what religious order you're in. If you're a Roman Catholic priest or religious. You took a vow of uh, celibacy, uh, rather, and. <clears throat> The point is, this includes no women, no men, no boys, no goats, no sheep, right? Know no yourself. Not, know yourself. Yeah, right? no masturbation. Just you are a chaste, continent man who right. is pure and lives for the Lord. And that's not too much to ask people. It is possible. It's not too much to ask. We, we, should, we should address this at some point that, that oh, I talk a lot in my, my book about Secular left are just the grandkids of the Enlightenment. Secular uh, religious right in America are the grandkids of Calvinist Protestants, usually, in America. And so even when you have right-wingers in, Amer in the American commentariat, they're usually coming from either a kind of explicit 
religious right point of view or a secularized, watered down religious right point of view. Even a guy who I've always respected, like Rush Limbaugh, right? He he's kind of he he'll give you sort of a smarter version of a smarter, more natural lawized version of what the religious right would say. And the, the viewpoint will always be the same. They think, oh, just let the priest marry because they don't understand the sacraments. They don't understand what a sacerdote is. They don't understand chastity celibacy and its role in the ontological participation in being, which is why it was important that uh, Marshall was talking about that some. It, it is a real lifting into the higher realm, uh, which is why the Platonism is important. The, the Protestants don't understand it, right? They, they do get like, look, Francis and his team are, are working against the traditional church who, you know, the, the Puritans and the, the religious right has never had a lot of love for, but they at least respect it in, in some way, in cultural ways. But so they understand Francis is going against it, but they don't understand that when they say, oh, yeah, we don't like Francis. We don't also like the traditional Catholic celibacy route. Just let these guys marry that they're actually working in tandem with the kinds of things that Francis's team would be saying. You right. have to understand it all together. You have to understand the philosophy the, the platonic philosophy of, you know, lift, you know, of, of participation in being, in godliness, um, in, in, you know, leaving behind our corporeal appetites. That's what the priesthood is left to us to do, to lead us in, not just to preach about, to preach about and then with the wink and a nod say, you don't have to really do this, even I'm not doing it, I have the higher standard. To preach about, say, I'm doing it, I need you guys to do it, you come up to me. That's right. Um, so yeah, Fulton, Fulton Sheen has this beautiful, um, this, uh, dichotomy of human intellect and human will. He says the human intellect to understand something higher than itself, you have to bring it down to you. Right. Which is why you end up using goofy, uh, mnemonics to, to memorize something that's difficult. And you, you know, you kind of make a babyish version of it the first few months you understand it, then eventually you get up to it. But the human will, he says, works in the exact opposite way. When you love something higher than you, you go up to it, right? Um, the, the will attracts all things to itself. So when you love something noble, you don't bring it down to your level the way your intellect does to comprehend it. You go up to it. That's what the priesthood is here for. And that's what Vigano, that's why he begins with this story of him at my alma mater, the Greg, in, you know, <sighs> 45 years ago. And that's where all this is eventuating. And it's really what the, probably the, the mission statement, if we had one, would be of this show. It's, it's reclaiming the old standard, not because it's old and not because it sounds cool to talk about old stuff or Thomas Aquinas. There's an aesthetic to it, but that's not the point. The point is this is the old, this is the true purpose of the, you know, ordained lay relation. The purpose of the ordained lay relation is they're supposed to be the best, the city on the hill. We emulate them. And it's the ultimate breakdown when you have this incestuous relation that, you know, characterizes a priest yeah. molesting, bothering a grown man, a grown woman or, or worse yet, uh, a young boy. But they're only like I said, the nested hierarchy should should be able to account for all of it at once. It's not over ambitious. They're, they're specifically, like you said, Supich is already setting the standards low, more of that, saying we're not going to do any of that. This is not about celibacy. Um, this is about avoiding outright molestation only. Yep. All right. Well, let's, uh, Vigano has three bullet points. I think we have to cover these three bullet points. Um, he says, I would rejoice greatly. If the summit were successful, uh, he's a, oh, no, sorry. although I would rejoice greatly if the summit were successful, the following questions reveal that there is no sign of a genuine willingness to attend to the real causes of the present situation. And then there's actually three bullet points that he adds here. The first one is, why will the meeting focus, ex uh, why will the meeting focus exclusively on the abuse of minors? These right. crimes are indeed the most horrific, but the crises in the United States and Chile, 
that have largely precipitated the upcoming summit have to do with abuses committed against young adults, including seminarians, not only against minors. Almost nothing has been said about sexual misconduct with adults, which is itself a grave abuse of pastoral authority, whether or not the relationship was, quote, consensual. And he's referring to, I think, a quote made by Supich on the floor of the USCCB last year saying, hey, we need to have different rules here. We need to realize there's two classes. There's consensual sex between priests as adults and then these other aberrations with with minors. Uh, I really don't like this. I mean, we've talked about it before in previous shows and Vigano's hitting the nail on the head here. Uh, the problem is that we have priests who are not chaste. These are the men who will turn off their priesthood and go to a gay nightclub and run up a bill and charge it to the parish or use cash from the plate. We know this is happening. We, I mean, there's so many examples. I mean, just go to LifeSite News or Church Militant. This stuff is happening almost every single week. And it's also happening on the Episcopal level. And we know for a fact it was happening with McCarrick and his circles. So that this is not even going to be discussed shows that Francis and those in charge of the summit meeting are hiding something. Because it's in their circles. They themselves yeah. would have to step down. Right. I, I mean, yeah, they're, they're saying specifically, I mean, again, it's sort of an admission. They're saying, well, we're not, we're not going to address that. Uh, you know, like I said, we don't, yeah, basically it's, it's as close as you'll ever get to an admission on their part that the, the, the formal, not just the material rules for, uh, sexual practice in the priesthood seems to have changed. You know, we're, we, we don't want to talk about that at all. When Supich said that last October or whatever it was, uh, it, it seemed to be, yes, there, there's, there's a distinction that can be drawn between molesting a boy and having a consensual, illicit sexual relationship. It's like, well, of course there's a, cons- uh, a distinction that can be drawn, but why bother to draw it? All you have to do is deal, like I was just saying, to deal from the top with this nested hierarchy and say no sexual behavior of any kind. It's easy. Yeah. But they, they, they won't, they won't do that. And that's, I think that was, yeah, that's at least his first bullet point. That's the whole of it. I, I thought it was the animating idea of the letter, but yeah, it's at least bullet point number one. Yep. Now bullet point two, Vigano says, quote, how does the word homosexuality never appear in recent official documents of the Holy See, this is by no means to suggest that most of those with homosexual inclination are abusers, but the fact remains that the overwhelming majority of abuse has been inflicted on post-pubescent boys by homosexual clerics. It is mere hypocrisy to condemn the abuse and claim to sympathize with the victims without facing up to this fact honestly. A spiritual revitalization of the clergy is necessary, but it will be ultimately ineffectual if it does not address this problem. Once again, uh, they're not talking about homosexuality. Why? Because most of them are homosexuals. Most of them are active homosexuals. Yeah. Take it away. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you. You People people were getting upset at you uh this past week for saying how do you know were you there you know things like that it's like well no all indications are that that most of them are in, including in the episcopacy so and there's this new sorry. book that's coming out if you hear about the new book oh yeah now the yeah, problem with the book it. is it it seems to say well let's just let everybody be gay and happy Let, right. let's let priests be gay it's kind of the new york times article that came out which basically said yeah we've interviewed all these clerics and what was the number 80 percent of vatican clerics 80 is the number i'm hearing out of this new book i am hearing it out of some some red hat uh, tricklings here and there 80 is the number yeah. right in the episcopacy which is high well, no, this the was this was in the vatican curia so okay, these are yeah, in, these are people I keep hearing 80 okay <laughs> 84 out of five but in the vatican yeah. curia this new yeah. book reports that's right 
based on interviews, admissions and all that, that the people, the men who are wearing collars, these are your your cardinals, these are your monsignors, curial officials who are clerics, 80 percent. So everyone's like, wow, there's a, you know, a cocaine fueled gay orgy. How could that ever happen? It seems like it actually happens quite a bit. It's just every once in a while we hear about it. Right. It's iceberg theory. Um, yep. Another thing I'm getting sick of, and, and I don't I don't mean to, to I'm, I'm, I don't mean this is a criticism of Vigano, but I, I'm just it's I'm getting like an allergic kind of response to it is the peremptory. Uh. All squares are rectangles. Not all rectangles are squares. Uh, oh, yes. Disclaimer that they're doing with all, all, you know, almost all of these molesters are gay. Not even almost all gays are molesters. It's like, you don't have to say that. That's that's extrinsic to the point. And I don't I don't know why people keep saying it. it's almost like the famous Seinfeld. This guy's gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It was a recurring <laughs> joke on the show. Like you don't have to say that. I, again, it's buying, and even even Vigano gives a nod to it here. And I'm like, I, yes. I mean, anyone with above a let's say fourth grade apprehension of logic understands the the nature of nested hierarchies, right? They go, they open up one way pyramidally. You don't have to say that. Yeah. When we're talking about, and you know, you myself. National Catholic Register, church militant. Everyone knows that. And no one's doing the weaponized ambiguity. Like, yeah, you don't have to say that. It's not ambiguous. There is no logical danger of, no logistical danger of the misapprehension that that um, square, you know, all squares are rectangles means all, all rectangles are squares. And I, I, I don't quite understand it. Yes, but the, the fact of the matter is the homosexual numbers in the Vatican, in the Episcopate, in the priesthood is sky high, you know, like 40 times higher than in the, in the population. Can people drink that in? Uh, it's, it's a bitter pill, but, but swallow 40 times higher, you know, in, in many cases than in the population at large. Yeah, 40 times. Yeah. S- staggering. I yeah. mean, even we, I mean that, that, so, those numbers aren't even like at an Elton John concert. <laughs> no, you know, or no. a Bee Gees concert, you know, no. or George no. Michael concert. This a is George a, Michael concert. Yeah, I bet yeah. you. I bet you it's not even forty times at a George Michael concert, but in the priesthood of all places. I'm having right. a, a kid invasion here. What's yeah, going on, you, kiddos? Hey, please, please say bad words to Margaret, and he's taking all our toys, and he's not letting his play with them. He is. He's saying bad okay. words to Margaret. And he's he, saying bad words. That's bad. And mom's mom's down there right now? And he's yeah. taking a baby toss. He's taking your baby dolls. Okay, well, I'll be down in just a minute. Just finishing up this video, ladies. Okay. Love you. Okay. But you only dealt with half the problem that I heard. Saying bad words and taking all the toys. Well, and right. and yeah, taking yeah. the baby dolls. And the baby dolls. Yeah, okay. that was part so of the toys, yeah. They had their own class of toys. Yeah. But see, they already said toys, so they don't have to include babies. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so committing that error. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, now this kind of brings us to the third point, and this is this is the ringer, Tim. And, and Pope Francis says, why? This is the third bullet point, folks. Why does Pope Francis keep and even call as his close collaborators people who are notorious homosexuals? So you might be thinking, God, that's kind of mean of you, Taylor, earlier in the show to say, you know, that all these people in, in the Roman Curia and the Holy See, you're saying they're gay. Like, how do you even know that? Well, right. I don't know. Why don't I quote one of the most eminent Vatican officials who's been working it in Rome and internationally for decades Archbishop Vigano, and he says, look, Francis keeps as his close collaborators people who are notorious homosexuals, not ones that are just like, oops, I messed up twice last year, notorious homosexuals. He goes on to say, why has he refused to answer legitimate and sincere questions about these appointments? In doing so, he has lost credibility on his on his real will to reform the curia and fight the corruption. Right. He's circled by them. Birds of a feather flock together. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you're right to point out the use of the adjective here. Notorious means 
look, these aren't just guys that, that, you know, are a little effeminate that speak with a lisp that most people, you know, would decent, we call it gaydar or like that guy's probably, probably gay, but I never seen anything technically yeah. wrong, you know, whatever. He, what, notorious means like, well, who's the notorious philanderer? I guess that's still in the, in the PC handbook. It's still okay to come down on philanderers, right? Cheaters. Yeah. Yeah, a notorious philanderer worth talking Tom Buchanan type from Great Gatsby, right? Everyone knows he cheats. Everyone knows he's got this apartment outside of Long City, uh, you know, Long Island, and East Egg, uh, and he's a notorious philanderer. A notorious homosexual is someone like, oh, I don't know, Uncle Ted McCarrick. Yeah, everyone knew about his Everybody infamous knew. beach house. Everyone's heard stories, not the kind of gossip that you suspect he, is He made was up. flirting. They say he flirted all the time with people. Guys. Like notorious flirt, like purposeful flirting, you know, the kind where, where everyone knew it went somewhere. And that's a notorious homosexual, notorious B.I.G. And <laughs> notorious that's, that's B.I.G. That's, and more money, more problems with it. <laughs> that's just ask McCarrick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Notorious. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Notorious T-E-D. <laughs> Notorious T-E-D. So those are the three points of Vigano. I think just a couple, pro- I'll make my uh, projections, you make yours. I think they're going to be the exact same, Tim. And that is nothing is going to happen. This is going to appease. Maybe some people are like, well, they got rid of McCarrick and they had a big meeting and they made new resolutions. It's not going to happen anymore. I, that's going to be like 5% of the people are going to buy that. Everyone else is going to be outraged. It's going to be just like the USCCB. And there's going to be blunders along the way. They're going to make mistakes. And a few crazy statements are going to be made. And they're going to get projected all over the interwebs. That's my projection for the February summit, which begins today. Two yeah. Well, when this comes out, two days. Yeah. All right. What about you? I mean, ditto. You know, same, same thing. I don't I, I think the number of those who buy it, unfortunately, will be higher than five percent. I mm. think the kind of center right Catholic commentary it will be only too eager to buy it. But everything else is obviously the exact same. And I think we're just saying what what Vigano is articulately expressing his view to be. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, the bishops are all going to buy it. it. And they're all going to tell their people, hey, we got the diocesan appeal. We need more money from you guys. Good news. The Pope fixed it all. Give us money. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Got, got, I got nothing I could add to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, let's pray the rosary. Guys, you got to pray for the Pope. I'm, I'm, we got to fast for the Pope. We got big problems. More of this is going to come out in 2019. So pray and fast. Get serious about Lent. I want to do a show, Tim, on Lent. I think we need to, speaking of like going back to the old ways, we need to get hardcore on Lent. I want to encourage people to do that. But of course, always pray the rosary. Have hope. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the heavenly horizon, not on this earthly horizon, because this earthly horizon is a valley of tears. That's it. Yeah, and yeah, hey, hey and uh, follow me on Twitter too, uh, Timothy at Timotheology. Follow there we him go. at Taylor, Taylor R. R. Marshall, Doctor Tim Marshall. Yeah, no, mine's, mine's Taylor R. Marshall. R. Marshall. Yep. That's it. Yep. Yeah, follow right. both of us. We keep it going. Keep it going all week. Signing out.